Greetings, everyone. Here we are back with Wisdom is Bliss, the four friendly fun facts that can change your life by me, Bob Thurman. And um, we've reached, we're in the middle of the realistic worldview, as you recall, talking about causation. And I have this illustration. I'll explain further what I mean by causation here. I am a New Yorker. And once I had an epiphany in the subway that left a last lasting impression. I had been practicing and thinking about the Buddhist biological teaching about the beginninglessness of life, that since no something can come out of nothing, all somethings come from other somethings, which solves the chicken and egg problem of which came first. Chickens and eggs just keep on coming one before the other, back and back, until they're lost to view from our point in time. It seems, co it seems correct, but there was this uneasy feeling about it, as if there must be some place where everything first came from, an original chicken or egg. On the other hand, who says so? Why can't it always have been going on? What's the harm in that? Once you let go of that worry, the implication of beginninglessness for me and you is that we have always existed in some form, having somehow become human in this life. <clears throat> but when I think about it all, given an infinite past with infinite past lives, I cannot rule out already having been every kind of being any number of times. And not only me, but every living being must also be the same. And so, Every single being there in that subway car must have been involved with me over numerous previous lifetimes in every conceivable relationship. No particular relationship can be ruled out in the context of an infinite past of countless relationships. As this kind of thinking was going through my mind, I kept on glancing furtively at the other people up and down the car on the east side Lexington Avenue line, going uptown from Union Square. In New York subways, one doesn't stare at other people much. Everyone is busy doing something, reading books, looking at their phones, or staring at the ads above the seats. Suddenly, people began to look familiar. Then it hit me that we had been involved with each other numerous times over numerous lifetimes, maybe as friends, maybe as enemies, maybe as parents and children, maybe as lovers, maybe as sisters or brothers. I had to control myself not to stare at people as they all began to seem so deja vu. From this experience, I developed a fantasy to explain to my friends the root of a Buddha's compassion, how I vow to save all beings from suffering, a kind of messianic determination called a bodhisattva vow might make sense. If one never meets other beings but once, and eventually all beings die and disappear, then we escape from involvement with each other. There is no need to make such a fuss. But if everyone has been involved with each other beginninglessly, and again endlessly, it makes sense that our involvement should be optimized. Who wants to fight and hate again and again? Who wants to hurt and be hurt again and again? Obviously, everyone should somehow come to love everyone else, and each want every other one of them to be happy, if only to prevent their unhappiness from spilling over upon oneself. Everyone should somehow come to help everyone else. So, Awakening to this realistic possibility, given infinity, I can now do my part by promising to optimize my and others' benefit from my side, at least for starters. This is a very realistic worldview that inspires wakefulness and compassion. Now, how to develop, actually, the realistic worldview? There is no better instruction for developing the Buddhist worldview than a short set of verses given by Dzongkhapa, inspired by the angel of wisdom Manjushri, and written in a letter to a student of his in Eastern Tibet. Quote, Though you may experience transcendence 
and feel the spirit of enlightenment of love and compassion for all beings, <clears throat> without the wisdom realizing freedom, you cannot cut the root of cyclic life. The wisdom of the realistic view is the most important of the three principles of the path of to enlightenment. The first being the transcendent attitude that lowers the priority of worldly ambitions and focuses on the great quest of life. And the second, the spirit of enlightenment of the bodhisattva, the loving will to bring all other beings with you into freedom from suffering. From the first mention of freedom from suffering, it is equated with relativity. Who sees the sure causality of things, of both cyclic life and liberation, and ends all objectivity convictions, thus finds the path that pleases Buddhas. So that means you begin to diminish your projection of absolute objectivity into the objects that you see as not being yourself, as being outside of yourself. You start to criticize that, you start to end that by knowing causation. And you don't really realize that things that seem to be objectively there are only transit, transitorily there, and they really are not really what they seem to be. And so you get rid of your objectivity conviction about them. And that way you're on the path that pleases Buddha. You're just getting started with critiquing a kind of absolute thing in itselfness in things. Okay? <clears throat> now, the first step of realism is the acceptance of causation, which implies not continuing to project intrinsic reality, a thing in itselfness into relative things we perceive, as I just said. But that's very, very important. It's kind of hard to see. It's not hard to see when you really think about it and simply just look at something and see how, when you see it, it doesn't just appear over there as itself. It seems to be coming from it within itself in some weird way, as if it has a real core in itself of being what it is. Just like you feel you have a real core of being who you are, like a fixed identity. So you project such, a, such an absolute identity of the thing in the thing. And it seems to have that. It has a massive sense of being the factually and actually what it seems to be as a thing all by itself. And you just happen upon it. So that's called the objectivity conviction about it. Then it says, then he says, Visions inevitably relative and emptiness free from all assertions, meaning that once you think about the emptiness of things, which you do, when you look to grasp what you see in the thing as if it were in the thing, and the thing will dissolve under your analysis. For example, I look at the floor. It looks like a massive floor in front of me. I realize that it, scientists will say it's made of atoms. Atoms are made of subatomic particles in, in the form of a uh, nucleus and electrons zooming around that. Subatomic particles have been smashed up in electron accelerators and finally seem to disappear under analysis. Although the desperate scientists try to pull together a sense of mass out of a very complex inferences developed from the way in which it explodes, and they call that the Higgs boson nowadays, so only recently. And even that, they sort of hedge around by saying, well, it doesn't quite behave as it should. So that means it's only what's visible to us. And there's a lot of dark matter and dark energy around it that make it behave in a way that doesn't seem lawful according to our laws of what we see, which really is a kind of pathetic disclaimer where they try to get out of the fact that it is, they don't really have a hold of an indissoluble Higgs boson like an object that they that is really a thing in itself, which is what they keep seeking, because they want a thing in itself that corresponds to our nomenclature for the thing, our name for it, so that then our names really fit on real reality and they're really real names. That's what they desperately want, which Buddha discovered thousands of years ago and ratified later by Nagarjuna and so many other people. There is no such thing, actually. So anyway, so voidness, visions inevitably relative, <clears throat> and emptiness free from all assertions. As long as these are understood apart, 
the Buddha's intention is not yet known. So that means that the emptiness or voidness are the relative visions, and they are not two separate things. There isn't like voidness underlying or beyond or outside of the, the vision, what you see illusorily. It is what you see. That's what the voidness is. Voidness is the ability of your seeing it because voidness is its freedom from any non-relative element, and that enables you to relate to it by seeing it. Here he cautions against the dualism, which leads to thinking of the ultimate voidness and emptiness and nirvana as a place apart from the relative world of apparent things. You know, the ultimate voidness being nirvana in a way, being a dualistic conception of nirvana as separate from the relative things. So here he wants to get rid of that dualism. And then he says, when you have gotten rid of it, but when they coincide, not alternating, just seeing inexorable relativity secures your knowing free of the objectivity habits. An investigation of the realistic view is complete. So now you realize that all these relational things are an illusion along the surface of the mirror of emptiness, of freedom, of voidness. And actually, there's nothing more to the mirror than that reflection in a way. And, uh, and so it's, they're not separate things. It's right at the surface is that reflection. And uh, so it isn't like there's a, an empty mirror beyond the reflection somewhere. The reflection is right flat on the surface of the mirror. So then you, when you see these things, even in a misperceiving way where they seem like absolutes, things in themselves, the mere fact of seeing them proves their relativity and frees you from being stuck with them as absolutely and objectively separate from you and your experience. <clears throat> so then somehow you begin to feel a complete connection. You expand your sense of identification to be with the illusion as well as with yourself. And yourself has part of the illusion, actually. So it's with you, too. Frees you from being stuck with them as absolutely and objectively separate from you and your experience. More, this is really I love, as seeing clears out absolutism and emptying clears away dualism, nihilism, you will see freedom dawn as cause and effect and will not be robbed by extremist views. So this is where, this is what I call the Chinese finger puzzle thing where your fingers are, you stick them in the weave and then when you try to pull them apart, the more you try to pull them apart, the tighter they are held in that finger puzzle because your pulling uh, creates the grip of them around the two fingers and so then you can't pull your fingers apart without somehow modifying the finger trap. You know? We all know what that is. So therefore, and it's the opposite of what it was, because initially, uh, when, you, um, when you see things, you get rid of nihilism, because they're there, so they're not nothing. And then when you empty them, you get rid of absolutism. And usually you do the emptying of the absolutism first. That is to say, something that appears to be a thing in itself, you analyze it, and it dissolves under analysis, and you discover its emptiness. And in a way, you can have a really wild experience of that when you're looking globally like it, and you're looking inside yourself or the indissoluble sort of identity component that is you, that's the absolute fixed identity of you. And when you look and look and look for that, and you spin and spin, and you penetrate and probe, and you drill to find the real you, what happens is the sense of the real you dissolves. And you, and you feel like you are just space. You're just empty. And that's sort of way where voidness and emptiness language comes from, is that experience. And then the danger there is that you will think that this, this feeling of not being a body, not being a mind, not thinking anything, not just being space, is the highest achievement, and now you're connected to reality. And that's the last moment of separating 
the space of everything happening from everything happening, as if the final thing is to be a place where nothing happens and stay there apart from the things that were happening. But what happens when you when you go in there with them and look for and look for what where that space is apart from everything, you discover it also is empty. It has then you discover the emptiness of empty emptiness, or the voidness of voidness. And when you discover that, you're no longer trapped there. And what happens is you're back in space time, and you realize yourself came into this space, and so it's a relational relational experience. And you will leave the space. Well, actually, what happens is the space itself fills up with yourself and all things. And you become, but now, since you, by having seen them disappear like that and had that experience, that, they, that every point where you were looking for a solid point that would be held there in the things dissolves under analysis. And then you're open to absorbing more points in your identification of the space that you are. So in a way, you spread yourself as space over all the things in the space. So you identify with everything in the final powerful way. At first, you just identify with some things like it was you're with them all in a dream when they seem to sort of come back and your sense of being separate from them comes back. So at first, when you first have that experience, there's a return from the experience as if it was another place and you come back, which is why it's really important to realize what's called the royal reason of relativity, which is that if you went to it and you came back from it, it then becomes a relational place, and that's the emptiness of emptiness. So that's only the relative emptiness, relative voidness. It's not an absolute voidness. Voidness itself is only a relative absolute, in other words. And again, it becomes, and the, and the relative is only an absolute relative. <laughs> so they both could defeat the one-sidedness of sort of duality. And experientially, where that comes when you're a Buddha, and you feel you are an infinite being, with all the things in the infinite being, you're all of them. And all the people in that, you're all of them. So you feel you're one with all people, and all animals, and all sentient beings, and all insentient objects. And then, in a way, you have the power to manipulate them and shape them. You don't create them. You didn't create them. Misknowledge created them as separate things in themselves, your, your wrong vision of them and of yourself. But now that you have the realistic vision of them all and you are all of them, your vision is from within them and without them, and it's indescribable. It's a miraculous vision. And therefore, you can do miracles with them which you wouldn't do just arbitrarily, and you would only do, and you do only do, whenever doing something with any part of anything is of benefit to any being in that, in the, among those things. So you can shape things to be of optimal benefit to them, basically. In other words, you have that kind of miraculous ability. From that, from that reasoning, you know, the faithful Buddhists will say, any good thing that happens in the universe is Buddha's doing. And any good opportunity is arranged by Buddha. And even I become one with all of that Buddha activity eventually, and then that's how you do become Buddha. You don't, you don't think of Buddha being outside you anymore. And this is the next step is so marvelous. Beyond having a realistic view, you then ensure that you don't fall off onto either extreme. You are, you're able to stay on the razor's edge by shifting the impact of seeing, where when you see things, even you see something that seems an absolute obje object out there apart from you, the fact that you see it means it's completely in the relativity soup with you. And you really are on one level one with it while also seeming it to be different from you. So that's why seeing you would destroy absolutism. And then avoiding that clears away that anything can be nothing. Because when you, by emptying it, you realize that it's still there relatively, because emptiness means it's empty of any non-relative element, and therefore emptiness clears away nihilism. So this sort of keeps you on this razor's edge. And when you understand these two verses, the realistic view is complete one, and the be and you're avoiding when you see freedom, when you see emptiness or freedom or voidness, dawn as cause and effect. You see it as still being a web of cause and effect. 
then you will not be robbed by any kind of extremism. You'll be illusion, freedom, indivisible. Illusory relativity, freedom, indivisible. It's marvelous. And then that makes you the effective in your compassion for all sensitivities, since you can't bear any sensitivity of pain in any being. And you immediately go to heal it. This final verse is unique. Let's see how I wrote it. This final verse is unique in this kind of instruction as it reverses your meditation on emptiness as antidote for projecting absolute intrinsic identities into self and things and on relativity as antidote for thinking empty things are nothing and carries it as very clear and carries your realistic insight into your daily experience so that now your meditation on emptiness you see it as a as a you see you're seeing things and your relativity participation as as an antidote to projecting absolute intrinsic identities into self and things and then you see relativity itself as the antidote for thinking empty things are nothing and carries your and the relative and the emptiness as relativity and carries your actually I think this editing is not quite right it's unique in this kind of instruction previously you meditated on emptiness as antidote for projecting absolute intrinsic identities into self that is to say you did that and you came up with an ex seeming experience of emptiness as if it was a separate thing self and things and then and you and you previously used relativity by seeing things and that was the antidote for thinking empty things and nothing. You know, that's correct, actually. And carries your realistic insight into your daily experience. So your daily life becomes non-dually unified with your contemplative investigation of reality. And seeing things becomes antidote to absolutism. And knowing becomes antidote to nihilism. It's what I call the Chinese finger trap version of living meditation. It turns ordinary experience into an automatic cultivation of liberating wisdom. Pulling away holds you tighter. This shows that the super education is not at all any sort of indoctrination, but really a liberation, a path for you to discover your existential freedom in the world. Your commitment to relativity, to causation, becomes the solvent that encodes your conscious or subliminal entrapment in all the various absolutes supposedly apart from your immersion in relational life. So this solvent, this uh, causation, your commitment to relativity and causation becomes the solvent that erodes your conscious or subliminal entrapment in all the various absolutes supposedly apart from your immersion and relational life. You don't get stuck in some experience of pure space because compassion and commitment to relativity push you back into the illusory interactivity of relativity. Our reifying bracket, making a thing out of a concept habit, is so powerful we can even think of a nothing as if it were a something. On the other hand, and this is subtle but important, Getting the absoluteness of relativity does not mean resigning oneself to the samsaric relativity of endless suffering, because viscerally knowing the absoluteness of the relativity seals the free-flowing bliss of emptiness that allows your compassion for others' suffering to overwhelm it. Very good. Overwhelm that suffering. That's the realistic move. That's good. So, so, so that means that you you, um, your compassion becomes an absolute, which forces the absolute to be relative. And while it's relative, then it's, you're forced to be responsive to the needs of beings, yourself and others. Thus, the realistic worldview puts us on a path of gradual erosion of the fetters that are based in our distorted inner sense that what we really are is some sort of fixated, isolated, absolute self problematically and temporarily enclosed in a relative and vulnerable body, dealing with potentially dangerous other relative beings and things, 
all of which are potentially troublesome for our intrinsically separate self. We get rid of this way of being. Once we keep our focus on our immersion in causal processes and examine all possible absolutes outside of relativity, we discover their emptiness of any separate existence and our own sense of isolated existence dissolves and we realize the absoluteness of our participation in relativity, which we can call the non-duality of absolute and relative. That is a mouthful, but if you follow it carefully, it bounces you back and forth almost poetically between the two opposite things that you hold them both in balance and being there in the razor's edge of bliss void indivisible you are holding therefore the absolute and the relative as the two weights of the tightrope walker uh, razor's edge tightrope walker and they keep you solid in your balance this is the discovery of the relative as the absolute by melting the projected absoluteness out of particular relatives. This is how wisdom becomes love. My favorite expression for this is Nagarjuna's famous shunyata karana garbham, emptiness as the womb of compassion, or you could call it freedom the womb of love. As the Dalai Lama says about the benefit of the realistic view, of non-dual freedom relativity. Through this understanding of interconnected reality, you come to realize that if good things happen to others, you will also benefit. If not immediately, then eventually. If they suffer, you eventually suffer. Therefore, you are better able to empathize with people from very different backgrounds. Compassion for them becomes easier. Buddhism is realism, that means, therefore, not religion as defined today. All of this is to say that Buddhism isn't so much a religion as a worldview, is what it is. It's a scientific worldview that leads to an ethic and a mental condition of love and compassion, wisdom and love. In, con in conversation with His Holiness the Dalai Lama, he and I worked out a fun formula that Buddhism, while highly spiritual, is only maximally one-sixth a religion, since religion, quote-unquote, is currently defined as a system of ultimate beliefs and associated ritual and moral behaviors, while Buddhism in practice consists of the three super-educations in ethics, minds, and wisdom, rather than a religion defined as a system of beliefs and associated ritual and moral behaviors. Ethics is based on the reality of interpersonal action, in other words, helping and not harming others. Mind is developing stronger powers of self-awareness and self-transforming concentration. Finally, wisdom is the understanding of reality, the scientific goal. The confidence in the possibility of understanding the world that one could become enlightened if one succeeds in the education as to how to control negative habits of body, speech, and mind. The confidence in the possibility of understanding the world, i.e., that one could become enlightened if one succeeds in the education as to how to control negative habits of body, speech, and mind, broaden awareness and sharpen insight and explore the nature of reality, is only a provisional belief, not an ultimate one, seeking confirmation or disconfirmation by your own experience. Buddhism as a religion, of course, taken as a religion, of course, which it can be, is wonderful for some, but will not by itself get one to the evolutionary summit of nirvana or Buddhahood, which is humanity's optimal condition. However, Buddha's threefold supereducation in life, mind, and science will get one to a deeper personal sanity and an appropriate public civility and adaptability on planet Earth, no matter what one's religious home. That's really good. So staying in any religion, because that's your culture, that's your family, and then you have a kind of comfort from childhood in that situation, including if it's the religion of, of, of humanistic m secularism, as long as it's not imprisoned in dogmatic materialism. 
Way back before I went back to graduate school, Geshe Wangji had told me I should focus on language, linguistics, and science, and that my work in the future would have to do with Buddhist science. Later, after I received my doctorate, he and the Dalai Lama commissioned me to translate the Tibetan collection of the Buddhist science texts preserved from the lost great Indian Buddhist universities, a collection known as the Tenyur, literally Tibetan for scientific treaties in translation. These texts are a 1,500-year codification of the wisdom knowledge that can govern our behavior and interaction with our surrounding animate and inanimate relativities and can liberate us from mental and physical suffering. As the original founder of the Buddhist inner science tradition that transformed Tibet, Buddha was compelled by his awakening to reality to serve humanity as an educator, not as a religious prophet, because he knew that you cannot be liberated through blind faith, but only through experiential knowledge, which we call wisdom. Education is the process that brings that deep wisdom forth, leads it forth, as in the Latin, educere, from within your human intelligence and your sensitive heart. To emphasize this again, the religious belief component cannot liberate you from suffering because only wisdom can liberate you from suffering. As the great 8th century Indian philosopher and sage Shantideva says in his Entering the Way of the Enlightening Hero, everything the Buddha taught was for the sake of wisdom. Everything boils down to salvation coming from your own sharp intelligence and your own experiential knowledge, your own wisdom. Again, as my final slogan, and after 60 years of working with it, quote, Buddhism, unquote, just seems to be realism. Buddhism is realism. That's my slogan. That's my motto. No need to worry about religion for or against. Just be realistic. It's just the A, the alpha principle. Nowadays, I just want to shout it from the rooftops. Of course, to get to the impact of that, you have to know that Buddha discovered that the reality you're being realistic about is the bliss you're working for, you're looking for. Buddha was overjoyed to discover that the real reality is bliss, the bliss energy of perfect freedom. Therefore, the experiential knowledge of that reality is also bliss, body and soul. One merges with it, one melts into the bliss that is released from suffering. One can even say reality is only thoroughly known by bliss. Subjectivity itself melted into bliss. Thoroughly knowing it is being it. Ignorance or misknowing of reality is not bliss. It is self-entrapment in separation, a state of alienation. That's ignorance. That is misknowledge that faces all the seemingly insoluble problems, misknowing, misperception, misunderstanding, these cause suffering. They are well, they are suffering. Luckily, misknowing is never total, as knowing is always coming through in the inadvertent, intuitive, and all too often unnoticed sparkles around the edge. And that's very, very important, that's like, when Ram Dass met uh, Mark Epstein, after Mark was a licensed psychiatrist, he said to Mark with his halting post-stroke voice, well, when your patients come to you, do you see them as already free? And this is key, because when you become Buddha and you become one with other beings and you empathize fully with their suffering, you probably couldn't stand it, even, a, even an infinite being, or nearly infinite being, unless you could see within their suffering, feel within their suffering, a kind of life force joy of their own really, con that they are made, made of bliss, of the clear light, of transparency. If you didn't feel that that transparency was already in them, even connecting to your oneness with them, you couldn't bear to, to bear all their suffering by, by your empathy. So therefore, you have to see their freedom as a potential within them. And then it's just a matter of helping diminish the misknowing and the distraction from them knowing what they really 
order, which everyone can do and will do, given endless time, as different kinds of beings. So they, they are suffering. Luckily, misknowing is never total, as knowing is always coming through in the inadvertent, intuitive, and all too often unnoticed sparkles around the edges. Buddha's discovery of reality was his experience of nirvana, pure freedom. On that happy morning when he fully awoke from misknowing and fully expanded his being to blissful knowing as infinite interbeing, he exclaimed, deep peace, misknowing, and finally emptiness, deep peace, clear light, non-proliferating, uncreated, I have found the one reality like the deathless elixir. When we know true reality, we know total bliss. That's so amazing, that for deep or profound peace, clear light. Well, that's, that's a good one to stop on. And we begin now, ignorance, wisdom is bliss, ignorance not so much. We carry on with this chapter or the next round, and we will probably finish it the next round. We're on page 29, paragraph at the bottom under the heading, Wisdom is Bliss, Ignorance Not So Much. And we dedicate the merit, may all beings, may I quickly become Manjushri myself, a Manjushri myself, in order to be able to establish all beings as Manjushris themselves, quite equal to me, fully enlightened. So may I become enlightened to get help them become enlightened so we all can be completely equal. Okay, that's how we dedicate the merit, to keep it safe and invest it in our evolutionary momentum.